Siamo qui oggi con Alvaro Vargasiosa che è ospite a Milano dell'Istituto Bruno Leone. Alvaro è saggista, è giornalista ed è un importante osservatore dei fatti politici ed economici negli Stati Uniti dove vive, in America Latina, lui è peruviano, e in Europa perché è frequentemente in Spagna e scrive eh, su molti giornali di quel paese. Buongiorno Alvaro. Buongiorno, un piacere. Alvaro, one of your book, uh, Rumbo alla Libertà, uh, had as a subtitle Perché la Ischierda e il Neoliberalismo fracassano in America Latina. Uh, what about neoliberalism? I mean, it seems to me that uh, neoliberalism was a word very important in Latin America in the 90s, basically, and in the 2000s as well. And now neoliberalism is basically a scapegoat for anything that goes bad in the war today. I mean, all the populists are targeting neoliberalism as their enemy, populists from the left and populists from the right. Is there anything we should learn about neoliberalism from Latin America? And first of all, what the hell does neoliberalism really mean? Well, uh, you have taken the answer from me. Nobody knows what neoliberalism means, and I have never met a neoliberal in my life. Nobody has ever met a neoliberal in their lives. Um, it's a term that was um, used against the liberals uh, in the 1990s in Latin America for things for which the liberals were not remotely responsible. <laughs> so it's a myth constructed uh, with the purpose of, I guess, um, turning a set of policies that were, that were very much identified with the 1990s into a diabolical construct that you could more easily, because of this, uh, delegitimize. Now, the problem is, as I was saying, that this set of policies uh, had nothing to do really with what was going on in Latin America in the 1990s. Yes, to a certain extent, there was a process of transition from a very statist economy to one that was less statist, technically speaking less uh, statist, but perhaps even more interventionist than before. You can have a, an economy that is going from statism to less statism, and yet at the same time from a certain degree of interventionism to a high degree of interventionism, because there, there are other ways of being interventionist. Uh, than being directly stateless. You can, for instance, have a situation like in the 1980s where you own, the government owns directly a lot of um, uh, companies and is directly, uh, as an owner, responsible for a large part of the entire GDP of production in the country. Or you can have a situation in which that um, production is mostly in private hands, as happened in the 1990s, unlike the 1980s, and yet have markets that are um, indirectly controlled by the government and monopolies that are protected by the government, which is what happened in the 1990s. So that was the really frustrating situation for us, the liberals, not the neoliberals, the liberals, that we were almost as critical of the 19, at least some of us, of the 1990s as we had been of the 1980s, and yet uh, the populists were able to entrench this perception that what was happening in the 1990s was really the implementation of what we had always stood for. And therefore, what became very unpopular was something that didn't really exist in Latin America. In other words, competitive markets, in other words, um, strong property rights, and, and so on and so forth. So, when the 90s was over, uh, Part of our job, and that's the reason for this book, and I'll finish the answer with this, was to revise the past, take a, a critical view of what had happened in the previous quarter century, and try to demythify uh, both populism as a legitimate response to liberalism and neoliberalism as the same as liberalism. Um, so that's what I try to do in the book, which basically amounts to saying populism, socialism, interventionism and neoliberalism have a lot more in common than they would think. Was this the situation in Argentina with Menem and the privatization in the 90s? I mean, uh, 
to what extent uh, we did have a backlash at a certain point because of corrupt government, there were somehow associated with privatizations nonetheless. You cannot, you cannot understand the Kirchner period from 2003 to 2014, um, sorry, 16 actually, in Argentina without understanding Carlos Menem in the 1990s. Um, in other words, you cannot understand the populist reaction to neoliberalism without understanding the failure of the Menem years. Uh, why? Well, because Menem was um, the epitome of the contradiction that neoliberalism is. He purportedly was trying to privatize the economy, purportedly trying to um, make government smaller, purportedly trying to devolve to society many of the decisions that used to be in the hands of political power. And to some extent he did. There was a lot of privatization, yes. But, um, and yes, some tariffs went down significantly. I mean, there, there was some of the stuff that we had been calling for, except that uh, government got bigger uh, through, for instance, public spending. Public spending went up, I mean, by colossal amounts during the Menem years. Uh, not only in the central government, but also in the provinces. Uh, they have a federal system. Uh, many of the provinces were in the hands of cronies of Mr. Menem. To the extent that ultimately um, the monetary arrangements which they had, uh, which had um, set the peso uh, on a par with the dollar, uh, simply blew in flames. And uh, what happened was the collapse of the, of the system uh, in such a way that to many people in Argentina and throughout Latin America, what had failed was really what had not failed uh, and what not, had not really been uh, tried at all, at least not in any coherent shape or form. So this was very frustrating for, 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 for many of us. But the degree, the extent, the depth of the reaction was such that it brought back populism, which only a few years before had been totally discredited by the 80s, uh, which was a period of total stagnation, 0% growth in, in Latin America. Uh, it, it's, it's called the lost decade of, of Latin America. Populism in Latin America is a very old disease. Uh, can we find the roots of this disease in some particular uh, phenomenon in some particular problem uh, that Latin America has been intertwined with for quite a while? Well, it depends how far back you want to go. You can go back all the way to pre-Columbian uh, times, the, the regimes, the systems that prevailed um, in, in those countries, in those regions, uh, were highly authoritarian, uh, highly centralized from both an economic and a, and a political uh, point of view. Uh, and of course, highly predatory. That's how empires became empires. The Socialist Aztecs, the Incas. The Empire yeah. of the Incas. Yeah. So you can go as far as back as that. And then you add 300, 300 uh, years, three centuries of colonial life under a regime that was, of course, uh, particularly centralizing and particularly monopolistic, which was the uh, Spanish Empire. Uh, that was not the Spain of um, medieval decentralization and fueros, uh, uh, so-called fueros, you know, small, relatively free local governments transacting with the king uh, their freedoms. No, th this was a very centralized power. This was the, uh, the, the monarchy that had emerged as a major power in, in Europe and in the world. Um, that wanted to rule directly over the colonies and that um, had complete control over commerce um, and had, of course, a, a relationship with the population that was basically um, predicated upon the notion that the population's uh, role was essentially uh, to serve under the uh, command of the representatives of the crown uh, 
in the colonies. So yes, there were exceptions, and yes, as, as usually happens, um, there was some amount of flexibility in the sense that many of the representatives of the crown uh, just simply found it so hard to actually implement the instructions they received from Spain that they made up their own rules. Uh, so there, there was this famous uh, uh, saying in, in Spanish throughout the uh, uh, colonies, which was, uh, se acata, pero no se cumple. Um, so uh, if you add on top of that, we, we've, you know, we've already been talking about, what, 500, 600, 700 years of history. If you, if you add to that uh, two centuries of Republican life, uh, starting with a very complicated 19th century in which you had essentially the conservatives wanting to reproduce the authoritarianism of the colonial times and the supposed liberals who were very liberal about reducing the power of the church but much less liberal about political freedom and economic um, openness, then you, you get what is essentially a tradition. And that's the word I would use. It's, it's a tradition. And so populism is the modern response um, to the emergence of the masses, the emergence of democracy, um, after a tradition of authoritarianism. And that could only be a very um, illiberal response uh, because of this tradition and because the caudillos who were in charge of bringing the masses into the process um, in the early 20th century and then throughout the 20th, 20th century had very little notion about uh, what had made the United States what it was, what had made uh, the better countries of Europe what they were. So it's a combination of tradition, it's a combination of the 19th century, it's a combination of the failure of our liberals in the 19th century, and a combination of the sudden emergence of the masses in sort of the early 20th century under caudillos who had no notion and certainly no practice and experience um, of liberty. Uh, if you were to name the ingredients, so to say, of populism, who would they be? I mean, um, confidence in leadership, I suppose, I mean, looking for the caudillo. Um, but also when it comes, you know, to the attitudes towards the economic life, towards the private sector, uh, is there some unifying elements into different kind of populism, so to say, uh, from Perón to Donald Trump? Well, there's, there's been many types of populism in, 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 in history, as, as, as you know. Um, so it's very difficult to define it. One of its uh, advantages from the point of view of populists is that it has no cogent, clear, perfect definition. In many ways it's a sentiment and it's a practice, but it's not an ideological definition in the sense um, of, of other ideologies. Uh, we've had uh, agrarian populism, we've had urban populism, we've had more ideological populism, we've had less ideological populism, we've had the populism of caudillos most of the time, but there has been a kind of populism that I would, I would call even more institutional than uh, uh, Caudillo-like, for instance, the PRI in Mexico. But by and large, I would say that populism has two or three important features. Usually, the, I would say almost uh, the sacralization of authority. They believe in authority in almost spiritual and religious uh, terms. Uh, and that usually needs an embodiment, and that's what the Caudillo is. It doesn't have to be like that. Again, you can have something like the PRI in Mexico embodying as a system, as a, as a group of institutions, this um, almost religious-like authority. But by and large, it has to be embodied by a caudillo. So you, you put a faith in the caudillo that is much stronger and more powerful than the faith you put in the institutions of the republic. This is a very important feature. Another really important feature is that Precisely because the caudillo has religious-like, uh, deity-like powers, um, the way to achieve results is not to go through the institutional process, but over and above the institutional process. So the law is at the service of the authorities, and particularly of the caudillo, 
um, and the law is, is therefore um, an instrument of the ability of the caudillo to interpret the wishes of the masses, the wishes of the people. This is a very important uh, 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 element. What is Chavez and Chavismo, if not precisely that uh, belief in the power of authority over institutions and the idea that because the caudillo is the ultimate interpreter of the wishes of the masses, uh, he is in a better position than institutions and the law to, in, to not only uh, address the concerns of the masses, but actually to make things happen. Uh, another feature that I think is very important is, and it has some Marxism built into it, is um, a class warfare of, t of sorts. I would say you always need an elite and you always need the underprivileged. Of course, the definition of who's the elite and who's the underprivileged can change, and it can vary from caudillo to caudillo and from populism to populism. But you always need a class differentiation. Um, that's, that's very important and very significant. Um, I think this has been very obvious in, in the socialismo del siglo XXI in Ecuador and Bolivia, and of course Venezuela itself. It was also very true of Argentina uh, back then under Peronism and, and under the more recent uh, populism of the, Kirchner, of the Kirchner years. And then finally, there's many more, but I don't want to uh, spend too much time. Um, finally, I would say another key fe feature is of course um, the state as the ultimate instrument of social justice. The idea that, that uh, uh, justice needs to be social and uh, that mm, the um, instrument of that social justice can only be the state uh, is key. But populism, unlike, <clears throat> unlike mm, communism, unlike some of the isms that are much more coherent ideologically, doesn't necessarily believe in the direct expropriation of all the means of production. It, the logic of the system can take you in that direction, ultimately, as happened with Alan Garcia in the 1980s in Peru. He was a populist, but the failure of populism in the end created a dynamic in which, of course, people were calling for the radicalization of the regime, so he ended up trying to expropriate the entire financial system and nationalize it. Well, the same happened under Chavismo. If you, if you study the Chavismo, the early Chavismo, that was not a government. It was government that, that was doing many inappropriate things, but it wasn't expropriating too many companies, only certain strategic sectors. Um, but after that, they began, of course, to expropriate more and more and more and more companies and, and entire industries because the system, again, pushed them towards it. Um, but again, the state as the ultimate redistributor, uh, of course, taken, this, this needs to be taken in the case of populism to, a, to an extent that goes far beyond moderate European-style socialism, which also believes in the state as a redistributor of wealth. You mentioned Chavismo, and um, of course Venezuela today is an economic basket case, it's a true disaster. Um, it's not just about economic crisis, I mean, it's about massive impoverishment. But still, Venezuela is considered with a certain amount of sympathy by another elite, by the European elite, by the European establishment. I mean, there's a lot of attention, uh, sympathy for Chavez, but even for Maduro today. A few years ago, together with other writers, you wrote a book on the Latin American idiot. I mean, and that book is really a collection of um, with the benefit of insight, ludicrous quotes by people that were just thinking that Fidel Castro was actually realizing paradise on earth in Cuba. Uh, why is the European intelligentsia, you know, so easily conquered by the dream of uh, a Latin American caudillo bringing social justice on this planet? I mean, this will be people certainly from the left but clearly within the democratic camp. I mean, people that would be extremely critical, you know, of abuse of power in Europe, 
extremely critical of the possibility of strong leadership to emerge in their own countries. But when they look at Latin America, all of the sudden they, they're like ending up in a novel in which they need a hero uh, taking charge of power and um, leading the masses in the right direction. There's a, an extraordinary book uh, by uh, Rangel from Venezuela, Carlos Rangel, which in Spanish is called Del Buen Salvaje al Buen Revolucionario. The English translation, uh, the, the translation is good, but the, 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 the title is, is horrific. Uh, the love-hate uh, relationship between the U.S. and Latin America, I, I believe. But in any way, in any case, uh, he has provided, he, he passed away many, many years ago, but that is really a classic, and he provided the best answer to that very important question. I believe it has to do with the utopian tradition. U Europeans invented utopia. And when mm, Europe discovered uh, what is now known as Latin America, which was not known as Latin America, and, and the, the term is a French invention, by the way, what happened was the Europeans uh, were going through, a, of course, a, a period of, of, of great uh, ferment, intellectual uh, and idealistic ferment. Um, and uh, there was the, I would say, the, the, the great belief in, in, in utopia. Um, you know, many, many people had uh, embodied this, this uh, era, but particularly people like Campanella and, and Moore and all these people. And so suddenly there emerges this whole new continent that extends massively uh, the civilized idea, uh, the civilized world's idea of the universe, um, and that coincides with this utopian ambition. Um, and I think that ever since uh, Westerners in general, and Latin America is part of, of the Western world, uh, Europeans and, and even people in the United States, much later, of course, um, have continued to believe in utopia. Uh, even if they wouldn't admit it to themselves. Uh, Europeans uh, got rid of utopia in Europe, uh, except in the 19th century when utopia was back in the form of especially utopian socialism, uh, Saint-Simon and Fourier and all, all these, and Owen and all these people, uh, and some anarchists as well. Uh, that was the re-emergence of utopia in, in Europe. But very few people actually listened to them uh, and what happened was fascinating, what fa fascinating because Latin Americans listened to them and imported uto their own form of utopia into Latin America. So that's why Auguste Comte, uh, Comte, the sociologist, the founder of sociology for many people, became very popular in Latin America. When nobody was paying attention to him in Europe anymore in the 19th century. So he was highly influential, for, for instance, in the early Brazilian Republic. He was very influential um, uh, under Porfirio Diaz in, in, in Mexico, which, which was the authoritarian regime that gave rise to the Mexican Revolution. Very popular in Venezuela under Juan Vicente Gomez, a, a dictator that, that uh, ran Venezuela for decades. Um, so we imported our own utopia. But Europeans then, of course, were very eager to then, um, I think, believe in utopia again once they saw it coming out of Latin America. So in a way, they, they exported it to Latin America, then Latin Americans were willing to import it, and ultimately Europeans re-imported it back from Latin America. So there's been this very fascinating dynamic in the field of utopia, in the field of, 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 of sheer political idealism, which has been very harmful, because it was a, if it was a pure intellectual gain, uh, I am all for intellectual games. Uh, it would be harmless, but no, because it means real suffering, real poverty, real regimes inflicting real damage and, 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 and harm on people. And unfortunately, we saw this again during Chavismo, uh, at a time when everybody in the world, I mean, anybody who had any information at all, knew that um, communism was a complete disaster and also one of the great tragedies of the 20th century. Uh, nobody believed in the Cuban regime anymore, and yet Chavismo emerges uh, 
gives back legitimacy to some of the uh, ideas that had been prevalent during the earlier Castro years. And again, Europeans and North Americans began to give it their seal of approval. So this was, this was very shocking to many of us. And the only explanation I have is that the utopian tradition never died, except that they have now combined it with a form of, some people call it racism, some people call it discrimination, whatever you want to call it. Um, you can only use very harsh terms for somebody who is willing um, to have less developed people um, inflict suffering on themselves uh, and applaud that suffering uh, when you in your own country would never, ever uh, give the seal of approval to uh, similar policies. So now, nowadays, we are seeing populism coming back to Europe too. Of course, we have very different kinds of populism. We have left-wing populism like Podemos in Spain uh, and up to some extent like the Five Star Movement in Italy. We have right-wing populism like Marine Le Pen in France uh, to women. In what sense do uh, European populists resemble um, Latin American ones? I mean, what did they learn actually at the <laughs> school of Chavez yes. and Perón? Yes, unfortunately, this is this is true, and it's a it's a phenomenon that's now um, sufficiently extended and sufficiently deep that I think it needs to be taken very seriously, and it needs, I think it needs to be combated in a very forceful manner. I think they have learned from their own tradition. Populism in the, in, in Europe in the 1930s was very powerful as well, as we all know. Um, they have learned, of course, from Latin America too. I think uh, a number of things are at play here. Um, the failure of the welfare state is one of them in Europe, except that nobody among the populists identifies the failure of the welfare state with the failure of the welfare state. They identify the failure of the wel welfare state with the failure of globalization, for instance. It's a, it's a very confusing um, frame of mind, but that is one of the things that's at work here, at play here. Um, I think the populists uh, also are profoundly nationalist and in many senses um, they are um, concealing their true colors and they prefer to blame some of the European institutions that are certainly worthy of a lot of criticism but for very, very different reasons um, because they really want uh, to go back to much more uh, enclosed uh, types of, of, of nation states. Um, and I think nationalism is at work uh, in there as well, in some of their criticism of, 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 of Brussels and, and, of, and of Europe, unlike the very legitimate criticism that's coming from the liberals, of course, towards the uh, constructivism of the European Union. Um, I think another problem that, that is uh, emerging here is the failure of the mainstream political parties, the left and the right in Europe. Uh, however much they despised each other and fought each other, over the last half century had come to be very similar to each other. The center-left and center-right parties of Europe were almost one and the same in terms of the policies they were implementing. Uh, high would call them the socialist of all parties. Um, I think that left uh, a lot of people without real representation in times of crisis. Of course, in normal times, in times of relative prosperity, that is not a problem because your loyalties uh, are not in conflict with your economic condition. So you can be happy uh, to continue to support the center-left if you're a socialist, the center-right if you're a Christian Democrat or you're a conservative. But in times of crisis, when the failure of the system needs to be blamed on, blamed on somebody, and then you realize how similar the center-left and center-right are on so many respects, in economic terms at least, then you have a crisis of representation on top of the crisis that's purely economic, economical. 
So I think this has led to the emergence of many of these fringe parties that are no, no longer fringe or marginal. Um, so I think we now have a, 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 a real problem, which is the crisis of, 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 of representation on top of that. And that has always been a feature of populism uh, in Latin America. When I was going through some of the features, I never mentioned this because the list was already getting long, but that's another important one. The failure of political parties to represent uh, people's um, uh, uh, expectations of political structures um, and, on, and of the city, of, of, of the Kivitas. Well, I think that is, a, is at play in Europe, um, and that makes it a lot more, more dangerous. Uh, and a lot will really depend on what kind of response we have from the mainstream political parties. If I was now a member of the Democratic Party in Italy, or a member of Forza Italia in Italy, or a member of Partido Popular in Spain, or a member of the Socialist Party in, in Spain, or, or you know, a follower of Sarkozy in France, uh, or a follower of, of Hollande in France, I would be thinking profoundly not so much about how to combat Jean, uh, Marine Le Pen as to how to profoundly reform my own political family, my own political party, to connect it to people's, uh, first of all, anger at the institutions, the prevailing institutions, and then, of course, expectations of those institutions. Because the best way to combat the adversary in this scenario really starts by making some strong changes uh, at home and being very self-critical with what you've been doing in the last half century. So something which is very important in this phenomenon is corruption and the perception of corruption. I mean, would have Podemos gained so much credit in Spain if it was not for the massive corruption scandal of the Partito Popular? I mean, the Five Star Movement was born basically as a reaction against uh, Berlusconi. And I suppose, you know, the same can be said also of several parties in Latin America. I mean, one thing that really motivates people is the anger at the political establishment because the political establishment look like a bunch of crooks. And sometimes, really, it is a bunch of crooks. Oh, absolutely. Um, if you think of um, the Kirchner years in Argentina, that was a reaction in part against the corruption of the 90s basically Carlos Menem, when companies, government-run companies, government or state-owned companies were privatized under monopoly conditions, monopoly conditions meaning the government created the monopoly conditions, in, ex in exchange for fiscal revenue. So the purpose was not so much to um, unload uh, some of these states back onto civil society, some of these state-owned uh, um, enterprises back onto civil society. The aim was to get as much fiscal revenue as possible. Of course, if you privatize a company have, with that in mind, what you're going to do is you're going to exchange a lot of fiscal revenue for a lot of monopolies because that's the only way you're going to get a lot of fiscal revenue. So yes, corruption was a, a, an essential part of this. And the same has happened in Europe, of course. Uh, clearly, the, the emergence of Podemos is a reaction against the corruption of the socialists first and the conservatives later. And what you said about uh, the Five Star Movement is very obvious to everybody who's been following Italy. Uh, and so, yes, uh, corruption is a key part of this. Uh, as liberals, let us not forget that in many respects, the root of this corruption is the excessive interventionism of many of those governments. Uh, the only way you're going to get a wealth of opportunities to be corrupt is, is to have a wealth of intervention. Uh, through which you can be corrupt. The idea that the political parties cease to be truly representative of people's uh, expectations has a lot to do with the fact that the political parties became mere agencies of personal uh, or even corporatist interests uh, rather than um, organizations that were trying to reflect the people's wishes uh, and uh, create conditions for their betterment. So they were basically seen by society as such, as uh, organizations that were really 
uh, and, and corporations that were really only interested in their own uh, benefit. To a large extent, this is true. In some cases, it's an exaggeration, but that doesn't matter. The perception is what matters in, 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 in political um, issues, and the perception is, 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 is exactly that. So I think the only way to significantly reduce corruption today is to profoundly reform the welfare state, which means substituting the welfare state with a different, much more open, much more decentralized uh, political and economic system. Until the mainstream parties realize this, not only are they not going to be able to sow the grass under the feet of the populist, but they're not going to be able to reclaim the real representation of the people. And it's going to take a long time, I think, because I don't, I'm not sure they realize this. How do you see populism uh, interplaying with the discussion on inequalities? I mean, sometimes we got the impression that really the populists are basically framing in a different way uh, what many social scientists are saying about raising inequalities all over the world, but particularly in the West. I remember that a few years ago you produced a series of documentaries and eventually published a book looking at it, going around and uh, searching for successful business cases in the developing world, cases in which it was private enterprise and private business that made possible for small city, population, different classes of people to flourish. Uh, so how do we see populism and in the inequality debate uh, going together or perhaps not? Um, should liberals have um, similar answers, I mean, both to populists and to those that stress perhaps too much uh, the problem of raising inequalities? Well, I think um, the last thing we should do as liberals is defend the status quo. And there has been a tendency on the part of liberals, uh, simply because of the need to uh, antagonize the populist, to be seen as being part of the defend defense of the status quo. Uh, I think that's a huge mistake. Because uh, uh, although where they're, coming, where they're coming from is not exactly where we are in terms of looking at inequality throughout society. They are, in many senses, right about one thing, and that's that the actions of the government have in many ways, uh, whether inadvertently or deliberately, uh, benefited a certain elite of people. Monetary policy today is exactly that. Uh, if you look at what's happening in, 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 the, in the monetary uh, sphere, you will see that the only people who have benefited from massive quantitative easing are people linked to Wall Street and the financial system. And in, in, in Europe, you would say the financial system. Uh, because what has been doing well in the last few years, thanks to that policy? What, what area of the economy has been doing well? essentially financial assets, the stock market. It's gone up so much that it's now unrealistic. It's not really reflecting the earnings of the companies, of the corporations. Uh, in the United States, um, earnings have come down uh, in the last uh, six quarters, I believe, quarter after quarter after quarter, and yet the stock market has kept going up. So if the stock market is essentially reflects in the you know, mid-term and long-term the uh, earning power of the corporations. How can you explain a stock market that keeps going up while earnings keep going down? Well, that's called the perverse effect of monetary policy. Now, what's the social effect of monetary policy is to entrench an elite of people and to have the wider society think of political institutions as the instruments of the financial betterment of an elite that's already well off. So let's by no means deny that there is inequality out there of the type that is engineered by political institutions. But let's at the same time warn society 
against the belief that uh, populism and socialism are a, a better way to combat elitism. Uh, no, uh, nobody can give me a, one single example of a socialist society that has been able uh, to give ordinary folks the power to compete against the elite. Uh, by contrast, uh, the history of free market societies, insofar as there have been real free market societies, is the history of first ordinary folks who have been able to move up the social scale because the system allowed them to. And many of the examples in my book about uh, poor communities that were able to rise economically are the very proof of that. And also of economic elites that either had to compete nobly in a noble way to continue to be a part of the elite or more often that were actually threatened and ultimately lost their position because of competition coming from up and coming middle classes and entrepreneurs. You look at the you know, 500 richest men in, 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 and women in the United States in the last half century uh, and the 500 most important and, and, and uh, corporations with the greatest market capitalization. And what you will see is a constant flux uh, that is very reflective of, of this uh, competitive uh, dynamic. So we have as liberals two missions that seem contradictory, but they are not. We need to combat inequality that's engineered by the government institutions through interventionism. I gave just one example, monetary policy, but there's many others. And at the same time, we need to uh, combat the notion that populists have an answer to inequality, when what they really have is alternative and much worse, perhaps, forms of inequality to judge by the results of all the populist policies implemented in the last few decades, including those in Latin America. Put yourself for a moment in the shoes of a Spanish classical liberal or of an Italian, or of an Italian classical liberal. At this moment in history, we are facing a corrupt establishment on the one hand, and on the other hand, you know, this populism which may lead all of us, you know, basically, uh, at the end of the pit. I mean, it will certainly lead all of us off track and perhaps lead to, um, you know, an even greater destruction of liberty and opportunity. What should be the number one priority of an Italian or of a Spanish classical liberal in this context? I think to answer that question, first you need to make a decision. Should you be fighting your fight in the sphere of academia, communications, the media, um, uh, the non-actively political sphere, or should you be fighting the fight uh, within the political sphere? I have over the years oscillated between the two. Until a few years ago I realized that it was a silly uh, question to ask because ultimately both are perfectly legitimate uh, and probably both necessary. Yes, you can influence of course the climate of ideas and eventually political leaders and political parties will do the right thing. Uh, I mean that is absolutely true if you don't influence or put it the other way, if you don't influence the climate of ideas, you will never get anywhere. But at the same time, since much of this is political and the populists or the enemies of freedom have such political power and political connections, if you don't have people fighting the good fight within that sphere, you are probably at a disadvantage. Even though, of course, fighting the classical fight, the classical liberal fight within the political sphere is much harder because of the incentives there are. But still, I would say to a classical liberal Italian, first make a choice. If you want, you can try to do both things at the same time, but it's probably not going to be possible. So you're going to have to make that very important choice. And then once you make that choice, give it your all. Um, 
you have first, before you can do good things for your country, to demythify uh, almost everything that has been taught to people since a very young age. Almost everything that many people believe in terms of public policies. But you will have, and this is an optimistic message ultimately, one great advantage, and which is that um, in fewer, I mean in very few moments in contemporary modern history have the devastating effects of socialism and populism and the welfare state been more evident than today. And if you base your credo on an experience that the masses can easily relate to because they're suffering it, and you do this with a modicum of uh, ability to communicate and ability to express your ideas, uh, you have a, as good a chance as there has been for classical liberalism in modern history um, to win the political and the intellectual fight. Uh, having said that, this will never be a permanent victory. That, that doesn't exist. Uh, we will always have to fight the good fight. It just doesn't happen that way. But you can make great improvements. Uh, and then wait until the next phase of populism and socialism um, comes back at you. And then by then you will be well prepared, hopefully, to, to resist. So these are very good times for a classical liberal. The bad times for a European citizen. I mean, this is a Europe that's um, well behind where it should be today. But for a classical liberal, I can think of a uh, few times in contemporary history in which it's been as um, challenged as it is today in a positive way and with, with, more, with greater possibilities for the uh, achievement of its intellectual ambition, which is, of course, to um, empower the idea of freedom. Well, thank you so much, Alvaro, also for thank this uh, uplifting message. <laughs> it's, it's always great to have you here at IBM. Thank you very much indeed. Grazie mille. <laughs>